Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back, friends. Thank you very much. Everyone came back? Great. Well done, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and your walks across the road. That was always fun. Uh, we are about to get into um, the panel discussion and conversations around the circular economy. How this works is our presenters will do uh, a bit of a talk at the top, then we're going to break into a panel sort of space where questions can be asked. Uh, there'll be an afternoon tea break in the middle with some more questions to follow that as well. So if you are requiring a snack, don't worry, there's only until three o'clock afternoon tea scheduled. So lots of lots of things to look forward to there. Now, um, again, I strongly encourage people to write notes while they're listening. It does help make your brain think more about those things that you're going to be taking away from this conference. It helps you be a better listener uh, to be writing some of these things out. Uh, and if you want to share any of the thoughts or any of the key messages from the presentations on things like LinkedIn or any of those other social media networks, uh, that would be great because the more conversations that start other than just in this room, uh, the better for a symposium like this. So our presentation or panel discussion is on the circular economy. We have a, a range of different presenters and what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you know who's going to be presenting and then hand over to the first of them. So we have Emma Clay, Regional Environment and Waste Manager for East Arnhem Regional Council and probably the most effective question asker at this symposium. Uh, Ori Van Lingen from Selen Parker. We have Narelle Anderson from EnviroBank who is joining us via Zoom. We have Jacob Wilson from Newgrow also joining us via Zoom. And from the Jingley Community Garden, we have Ian Hollingsworth, Esther Egger and Gwen Draper here with us. So can we have a round of applause for all of those presenters? It's great. So many different people, so many different voices, which is really important in this conversation. So to kick things off, all the way from East Arnhem Regional Council. Could you please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Emma Clay. Hello everyone. I promise you can get your payback with the question asking at the end of my presentation. <laughs> um, oh. So I would like to obviously start off by acknowledging the tr traditional owners of our land, the um, Larrakia people in Darwin, the elders past and emerging. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the Yungu people of East Arnhem on which this presentation is based today um, and give a quick warning that this presentation may contain some images of deceased Aboriginal people. Um, so if anybody needs to leave the room because of that, completely understand. So um, the lovely Meredith asked me to convene this panel on the circular economy, and I just thought it would be beneficial to give a brief introduction on what is a circular economy um, and what better way to do that than Google a video rather than me doing it myself. <laughs> Many systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no land. Instead, materials flow. One species waste is another's food. Energy is provided by the sun. Things grow, they die, and the nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet, as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machine packs up. So we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often reducing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can we? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy? Let's start with a biological cycle. How can our waste then reduce it? By rethinking and redesigning products and components and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. 
So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of meeting, a way to cycle valuable metals, polymers, and alloys, so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throwaway ingredient, we'd adopt a return and renew one, where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers, their technical materials being reused, and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is, there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. But the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. <clears throat> we have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, we really can rethink and redesign our future. Cool. All right. So um, here, this here is a um, very well known diagram of the circular economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So on the left hand side, we have the organic streams and basically how they move through that linear system until they get to the consumer. And there's all sorts of things that can then happen to recycle them and get them back into the economy. And on the right hand side, it's everything that's not organic, that's technical. You'll see down the bottom here, landfilling and energy recovery uh, leakages from a circular economy. So because of that, I personally believe that the waste industry cannot be the driver of a circular economy because waste is a leakage and in a successful circular economy, none of us have a job. The aim is to get everything that's coming into a landfill back into the economy. So it needs to come from production down. Luckily, we live in a region where we have the masters of a circular economy, our traditional owners of the land, who have successfully managed Australia for in excess of 60,000 years without any wastage and without the need for landfills at all. Um, our Indigenous people have only taken what they need and they've shared what they get with everyone. As late as the late 1970s and early 1980s is when these photos were taken. In some of our communities in East Arnhem Lands, we had some amazing market gardens. So these um, photos are taken from the missionary times in Gallowinkle. Um, we had timber mills in operation. We had um, commercial fishing. We had brick making, a bakery. The market gardens supplied the shops in community. And um, there are even stories of the timber mill, which produced cypress pine, um, the timber from those mills being shared amongst other communities. So they would mill the timber, timber in Gullawinkle, and then that timber would get floated on the tides to other communities in our region, which is just absolutely fascinating. So what happened? economic development happened. <laughs> so we have a, a, a massive mine in East Arnhem region now. And along with that mine came regular barges to East Arnhem land. 
shipping in container after container of stuff. These barges started quite randomly, then became monthly, then became weekly. And we now have some communities that get a twice a week service of barges coming into town. Not a lot of stuff going out on those barges. And these are the photos. So that, that photo of that shed up on the right is the packing shed of the market garden that you saw the photos of earlier. It is no longer operating. That there is also a brick, brickworks facility that was once fully active and is no longer operating. So what do we do? So in 2020, if we want to start a market garden and we want to do some sort of project, we need to do a risk assessment. And in East Arnhem Land, there are a lot of risks. There are, there's isolation and remoteness, high transport costs with complex contracts attached to them, small populations, low socioeconomic communities, predominantly an unskilled workforce. There's lack of investment in the region. We have a tropical climate, which includes cyclones, and we have harsh soils. But what if we flipped it and actually looked at those barriers as opportunities? We are isolated and we are remote, which means we can do our own thing. Our high transport costs associated with complex contracts means that something that would cost a lot more in Darwin may be feasible because of the transport that we, that we incur out in East Arnhem Land. Yes, we have small populations, but that's a smaller population to service as well. Low socioeconomic communities mean that if there are incentives, they're more likely to be bought into. We do have a predominantly unskilled workforce, which means there is many, many people looking for training. There is a lack of investment in the region, which means there's minimal competition. We have a tropical climate, it means lots of rain. We have harsh soils and we have lots of green, green, green waste that can be composted and put back into those soils. So what can a council do? I've already said my position in that we can't drive a circular economy, but we do certainly have a role to play in that circular economy. We are, oh, we are consumers as a council. We do have the opportunity to implement recycling and we do have the opportunity over here to deal with green waste one way or another. And we are also often, if we run the landfills, the end the end of the linear stream as well. So the first thing that we wanted to do in East Arnhem Land <laughs> is stop this one-way transportation of stuff. I don't know if you've ever been in a community on barge day and for you communities that are accessed by truck, I don't know if it's the same for you. And so where I'm talking about barge, you just imagine a truck. Um, barge day is a buzz, like everyone's down at the barge, there's stuff coming off, there's this vibe in there, it's exciting. Everyone does their shopping. There's just stuff coming in. There's vehicles, there's sea containers. It's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And for the, I don't know, the 30 or 40 pallets and shipping containers that might come off a barge, you're lucky if there's two or three that are going back on. So we wanted to address that. Um, so initially we approached Sea Swift to about getting some of these waste streams off East Arnhem land. And they agreed that it was a good idea. Um, I can't speak highly enough of Sea Swift. And so they, we set up a sponsorship arrangement with them. And they decided that anything that was recyclable that we could get to a recycler coming off, off the barge in Darwin, they would backload for us for free. So this was absolutely amazing. So a couple of years ago, we started shipping out some recyclable things, mainly container, uh, you know, cash for containers type stuff. Um, yeah, mainly that. Anyway, it was very, very nice of them to come to the party with this sponsorship, but it didn't actually offer us any certainty. So when um, we were looking at our cash for containers, we started... 
we started off with the cages in community where people would um, put their containers into a cage and that would get um, shipped off and the funds from that would go into a community account. Um, we could see very clearly that there wasn't a lot of buy-in with that and so we wanted to um, extend it and trial some mobile depots. However, all of this depended on us being able to get our waste out for free long term and we didn't have that written in a contract. So luckily enough, late last year, our um, barge contract was up to be retended. And so we wrote, wrote it into a contract, which is amazing. We've got a very progressive director in that space that said, so what if it adds cost to all of the other things that council are bringing into community? That's the problem. Everyone's bringing stuff in and we're not getting it out. So that's exactly what happened. And it didn't actually add a very little cost at all to the contract as it turns out. Oh, I'll just go back. So the way, the way that contract is set up, everything that's shipped out that's recyclable is free and any um, recycling infrastructure that we need shipped in, such as bulker bags to house our recyclables, clean up bags for people to go and pick them up, recycling cages for collecting recyclables, that's charged at the minimum charge at $33. So it's worked quite well. So we had the freight sorted at that stage. So now it was time to get as much stuff out as possible. So the first step is looking and seeing what stewardship, stewardship schemes are available in community. Um, the, the Tech Collect and the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme is one of them. Um, and I'm pretty proud to say last financial year, we recycled 4.3 tonnes of e-waste. Um, so, Mobile Muster is another one, and I'm sure most of your councils have a Mobile Muster box um, in your reception areas. So at last year's symposium, I actually was standing right where I am today and said, wouldn't it be great if we could have a, a cash back incentive, just like cash for cans for other things like mobile phones? And after my presentation, Spiro from Mobile Muster, I think he's presenting later on, um, he came up and saw me and said, let's do it. What do you want? What do you want to chat? What do you want to give back for a mobile phone? So we stood here in the room and I said, oh, well, what about 50 cents for a phone, 10 cents for a charger, 10 cents for a battery, 10 cents for a wall plug. Let's give it a go. So we started that not long after the symposium last year. Since that time, we have recycled 853 phones and 218 accessories. Um, our biggest count for one day was 210 phones in one day in Millingimby. So cash for containers, I spoke to you about this and like there really is a whole other presentation just in, just in this information. Um, yeah, we're shipping out massive quantities now. We've had a real journey that has gone from recycling cages in each community to running depots. Um, when we first, tri we, we trialled our first dep depot in Gallowinku in July last year, and we got 17,000 containers on that first day. So we were like, there is a demand for this. <laughs> Let's roll this out. So we initially started with depots every three months. Um, and it did not take long to find out that that wasn't enough. People wanted it more. There were just too many containers. We were inundated. Then COVID came along, which meant we had to take a break for three months. And during that three months, we wanted to keep people engaged. So we went and um, organised a big bulker bag for every house in community for people to keep collecting if they wanted to. And then when we started up again, like it's just been, yeah, amazing. Um, so we've gone from three monthly, we are now offering the mobile depot monthly across all of our communities, except for Millingimby, who's been our biggest community for engagement by far. We have just employed some recycling officers in Millingimby so they can offer it fortnightly. And I would not be surprised if that actually goes to weekly very soon. Um, 
So to give you some stats, because everyone likes stats, um, up until before COVID, so we started in about July 2019, and then until December, we did about 300,000 containers across the region. Since starting up after COVID, which was July again, so yeah, not that long ago, um, we've done 400,000. So we're up to 700,000 containers across the region as we speak. And um, I expect to get to a million containers kind of within the next couple of months now that we're doing it more regularly. So they're the things that there are national schemes set up for. But there's a whole lot of other waste too, which doesn't have a scheme. It's not free to get rid of, such as waste oil, um, tyres and scrap metal, which are huge issues in our region. So as a council, we have to look at if we can get rid of these and recycle them. And it does involve shipping them out to Darwin and we do incur a cost at the, at the end of that. So we're doing it. You know, we can't just take the one that's free and the one that provides us with some income and not do the rest. We have to weigh up the environmental and the social benefit as well as the economic benefit. And as far as we're concerned, they far outweigh the economical cost. Um, Ori is here today. He's going to talk about our little scrap metal project that we've got happening, um, kicking off this week. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty exciting. We shipped out, oh, I didn't write it down, but I think we've shipped out, I think, eight 10-foot containers worth of tyres over the past few months. And I think, I don't know, because I haven't been in the position all that long, but um, I think that was the first time for that to actually ever happen in East Arnhem. So that's pretty exciting. And, you know, once you start managing these streams, you've got to create somewhere for this waste to go. So it's had this awesome flow on of benefits. You know, every one of our sites has had a little bit of an upgrade to create the bays for all of these different waste streams to go with new signage to say where it's got to go, safety signage to say how you've got to handle it. Um, we've got new plans, environmental management plans, emergency response plans in place so that we can handle it safely. So all of that waste handling and management across our council has improved because of our steps to go and recycle these things that we weren't. So here we are as council, as a consumer. So um, I think councils have a really big role to play as a consumer in the circular economy. And I do feel that we should be leading by example. Um, ways, we do have some good things in place already. I did want to say like our buy local stuff that we have set up in the NT is really, really great. Um, but yeah, we need to do more. Um, procurement policy. So, you know, Dipple was here today saying, oh yeah, we will accept, um, you know, a, a a non-conforming tender, but they've got to submit a conforming tender as well. Our policy is exactly the same at East Arnhem. Like if someone's got an innovative idea, we will accept a non-conforming tender as long as they do double the work and submit a conforming one as well. There's little things like that that could do with looking at um, to achieve circular economy outcomes. Um, you know, environmental policy and procurement policy um, there's no excuse for any council in Australia to still be buying styrofoam. And it does happen. You know what I mean? Like we need to be having a really good look at our procurement policies and making sure that we have a waiting for things that are sustainably produced and for things that have recycled content. For example, I've got a really great example. So council is in the process of organising new shirts across all of our council. It's not my job, thank God, but it's kind of become it. Um, so I said to the person ordering the shirts, what are these shirts going to be made out of? Like, let's not get polyester because A, it's plastic and B, it's hot. And I was told we needed some content of polyester in the shirts because of the sublimated type of printing that they wanted to do. And I looked into this printing and she was actually right, apparently. So I was like, okay, there's got to be a solution to this. Um, 
she could not find a solution, which then came back on me. And it actually took me a whole day of contacting shirt companies and shirt providers to find a shirt made from recycled plastic. So it's difficult, but I've got it with me. Do you want to? So that shirt is made from eight bottles, apparently. 100% recycled plastic. Thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, feel free to send it around the room for people to have a feel. But the point is that shirt was really, really difficult to find. And unless I had have said something, no council is ever going to going to go and buy that and I, I'm not even sure that we will end up going forward with that so um, we have a responsibility as a council to use our buying power as a consumer to invest in these markets otherwise we are going to have recyclers standing up on stage saying there's not a market for it there's no there's no market nobody wants it it's because we're not demanding it so what are the next steps Obviously, I'm going to listen and learn from and work with my community constituents, which I'm very privileged to be mostly Indigenous because they, they know how to manage this land, as I've said already. You'll see that my presentation did not talk about organics recycling at all. It's something that I think, think is, um, what was it, low-hanging fruit, and it's a space that I really think we want to move into in the very near future. Can we re-establish market gardens? Can we start doing some plastic processing on community? Do some 3D printing. We're shipping out bulker bags and bulker bags full of PET plastic that we're collecting through the container deposit scheme. Can we do something with that ourselves on our own land, create our own jobs? E-waste processing. So I've been pretty lucky to go to an e-waste plant where they pull all their computers and TVs apart and get the gold and the silver and all the copper and all the great stuff out. Could we do that ourselves? That's it for me. How about the second panelist on my list? We've got Ori Van Lingen from Selen Parker. Can we have a round of applause for Ori? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Ori Van Lingen. I'm the uh, Trading and Operations Manager of Selen Parker. Uh, we are based in uh, Pinelands. Uh, we've been operating since uh, 2013. Um, and yeah, let's get started. So Selen Parker, um, we're obviously a metal recycling company, uh, physical assets, we have state-of-the-art equipment. Just to give you an example of uh, one of the uh, sort of the art equipment that uh, we have, not necessarily in Darwin, but in uh, New South Wales, in our, our biggest uh, yard in, uh, sorry, Blacktown. We have a desalination plant that actually uh, puts a saw that comes in from the waste in through a system, and it actually uh, separates all the precious metals out of it. We even actually get gold out of some of the soil. So state-of-the-art equipment is um, definitely uh, something that uh, we look to invest in. Uh, also have a number of uh, trucks that we transport with. We have a national footprint in Australia. Our organisation has been around for 54 years. Uh, it started off with two mates in a ute back in uh, 1966. They were just going around picking up scrap and um, 54 years later, it's grown to one of the biggest privately owned uh, scrap metal companies in Australia. Uh, second point there, 100% Australian family owned and managed, uh, ample finance, uh, financial resources, including 80 million return, uh, retained earnings. Our people across the business, uh, we've got over 380 people employed. So Selen Parker Metal Recycling is one aspect of the business. Uh, we've also got an Oxy uh, company as well. Uh, frontline management, which uh, manages the procurement of uh, or sale of uh, defence uh, machines and products as well. 
Uh, safety is our, one of our number one priorities in our, in our business, uh, obviously with the top material that we, that we handle and the uh, projects that we go into, such as mining, construction, we have to make sure that our workers go in there and come out the same way they went in. Uh, in that case, we have regular training and uh, we have a big focus on employee well-being. Uh, similar to the FIFOs that go into mines and stuff like that, um, there is cases where people um, need that extra support and we've recognised that and we're giving that support to them. Our systems, we have a uh, scrap assist uh, Weybridge system that uh, manages all of our scrap uh, inwards, outwards and, um, and uh, exports. Uh, we have a de dedicated WHS system in place, uh, same with our environmental planning and security CCTV as well. So within the NT itself, uh, we have a number of machines that uh, help us process uh, and get uh, our material ready for export. Uh, we have material handlers, excavators fitted with grapples, a 35 ton, uh, sorry, forklift, as well as five ton forklifts. Uh, processing, we have a 1400 ton static shear. I'm proud to say that's the only static, uh, sorry, permanent shear in the NT. Uh, we also have a non-ferrous baler, mobile ferrous balers that go off site to remote communities, uh, a mobile hydraulic shear, uh, in transport, we run road trains, hooklift trucks, skip trucks, flatbed tilt tray, uh, flat top semis, and we have a certified in-ground way bridge. So these are just some of the uh, uh, places that we've been to uh, in, in the communities. Uh, we've been as far as the Kananara tip for Wyndham Shire. Uh, since 2013, we've collected over 4,700 tonne of scrap from the landfill that uh, incorporates domestic and commercial steel, vehicles, and used lead acid batteries. And we've mobilized a 25 ton excavator uh, with a grab and magnet, uh, as well as a mobile baler. And to transport those uh, materials, we've uh, utilized a triple road train. Uh, same with the Litchfield Council, a bit closer to home. Since 2018, we've uh, removed 2,500 tonne of scrap uh, same domestic and commercial steel vehicles, lead acid batteries, and similar sort of equipment. We're starting a regional council only late last year and start of this year. We removed over 400 tonne from the Jabiru landfill. And uh, this year we've started at the city of Darwin Shoal Bay waste transfer station. And since April, I believe we've collected over 670 tonne worth of scrap from site. So this is just a few photos from the uh, Shoal Bay waste transfer. Uh, so you can see in the top right, the pile of scrap that's at stage two. Uh, that's before we get started. There's a baler over there in the corner and our excavator with a grab on it. This is a pile sort of in between, loading into a, one of our semi trailers. Unfortunately for this particular project, we could only use a single trailer at a time because of where the scrap metal is. It's on top of a hill. So we've uh, transported it in single, single semi-trailers. As you can see down here, it's a little bit left over and this is the end result. So that end result is created by using a magnet over the area. Um, you can see that Viola have done a fantastic job. Thanks, Nick. For putting it all into a, an area that we can uh, gain access to and safely uh, manage uh, putting it into our semi-trailers. But it just goes to show that, um, you know, what we do makes a, a big impact and uh, not too sure what the uh, end result will be, but um, hopefully we'll uh, take more scrap out of there in the near future. So leading on to uh, East Arnhem Regional Council, they've engaged us to assist them removing uh, a number of, uh, or removing from a number of communities. We estimated over 3000 tons worth of cars, white goods and heavy scrap. Uh, this particular project will take uh, roughly around six months. Unfortunately, it will be interrupted with the uh, weather that we've got going on at the moment, but we'll make a start on Groot as of Monday next week. Uh, machines are being deployed over there as we speak. Um, so that will hopefully only take about four weeks 
that will be done and dusted, and then we'll get started on the other communities next year. Our approach is to have dedicated equipment, as I said before, the baler, excavator, trucks. In this particular project, project because of the uh, remote location, we've uh, decided to take a uh, side loader over with um, containers. Uh, we're going to bale what we can. Uh, that will go onto Sea Swift's barge and then all the other different types of uh, material that we can't bail will go into these containers and we'll ship back. We've got experienced personnel between the operator and the driver. They've got over 20 years of experience in the scrap industry. So they're very, very experienced in what they do. Um, obviously using a third party to barge the equipment over in Sea Swift. And as Emma pointed out before, they'll be uh, transporting it back to Darwin. Once it gets back to Darwin port, we'll then engage our drivers to go and pick up the material, bring it back to our yard to process. Um, uh, so the process material be, uh, sorry, process material will be consolidated into our own scrap pile, and then we'll uh, bulk put it into a bulk carrier and then uh, ship it off to our Asian markets. Sun Parker will host a recycling education seminar uh, for the local community uh, with the help of Emma. Uh, she's asked us to uh, put on a bit of a presentation and engage with the community and show them what, uh, what else can be done because there's lots of different products within scrap metal. Uh, there's the coppers, the aluminiums, stainless steel, different types of products that can be segregated and there's a monetary value in that as well. So if we can engage the community to look into that Hopefully the money incentive will encourage them to be a bit more proactive and separate their materials. Um, it's only gonna benefit themselves as well as the environment. Uh, the contract management, we've got a EOI package, including survey and photos. I must uh, give credit to Emma and her team at the East Island Regional Council. They engaged us to come over and have a look at the uh, islands and just the logistics to get there, um, what they wanted us to do their future endeavors to go forward is just phenomenal. So kudos to you for uh, engaging us, but uh, yeah, we'll do the best we can to uh, keep this uh, relationship going well into the future. Uh, so we'll do a pre-tender, we did the pre-tender inspection, uh, pre-mobilization discussions have happened. Uh, Emma's been on top of the council to make sure that everyone's informed of what we're gonna do when we get there and uh, the process will start with a pre-start meeting before anything gets started so we can run through the risk assessments. And then on top of that, we'll uh, stay on uh, top of things with a monthly report back to the EIC so they know uh, what we're doing and uh, what we're actually um, taking out of the uh, community. And that's a bit all for me. Thank you very much. Hey, sorry. Okay, uh, our next presenter who's going to be a part of this panel is joining us via Zoom. So, Narelle, can you hear me okay? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, look, this is going great. All we've got to do now is get your <laughs> lovely face up on the screen with your presentation and then we'll be able to hand over to you. Uh, sure. Oh, look at this. Flawless. There you go. We can see you, Narelle. Excellent. Wonderful. I'm going to hand over to you. Can you please uh, put your hands together and welcome Narelle Anderson from EnviroBank. Thank you. Um, now, is my presentation being driven from in the room? So um, I guess if I do thumbs up, that means to change the slide. Will that work? Just give us two seconds, Narelle. We're solving that one. Do you have an option on your screen to run the PowerPoint? Uh, I do. Yeah, because if you go to screen share. Yeah. And I like your background choice as well for Zoom. People have got really creative with it. I think you've done an excellent job there. Uh, Okay, it's probably not going to work for me to screen share due to our no? uh, very extensive. Give us one security. second, Michael's just having a quick look. Do we? 
just we're just double checking that we've got a copy of it. What was it called again? Uh, Envirobank Circular Economy. Not to worry, I can I can get started and then if the presentation um, catches up, great. And uh, if not, we can perhaps um, circulate the circular economy presentation. Yeah, let's do that, I reckon. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to you now, Narelle, and we'll see what we can do, but otherwise uh, push forward with all of the enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, I've got it. Um, well, firstly, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, uh, Emma, for inviting me uh, to join this panel. I'm super excited um, to speak to everybody today and share with you uh, some of the learnings um, that we've had from the work that we do in the Territory. But just by way of background, um, obviously, my name is Narelle Anderson, and I'm the Founder and Managing Director of EnviroBank Recycling. And I've been in the waste and recycling industry for let's say 20 years. It might be a little bit longer, but I'm only going to uh, own up to 20 years. And EnviroBank, as it, in its current format, is actually one of the scheme coordinators in the Northern Territory. And we also run the largest depot network in the Northern um, Territory, operating in the container deposit market. We are also a container refund point operator uh, in other states. So in Queensland, we have 51 container refund point sites. In New South Wales, um, we have two. We were the first company to bring reverse vending machines into Australia. So we're a provider of reverse vending technology and the first company to own and operate a high speed um, counting depot in the Northern Territory. And that sits in our uh, Pinelands depot. Um, which just coincidentally is right next door um, to Selen Parker. So all the good recyclers are right next door to each other. Um, I, I was really um, interested to look at Emma's presentation and, and specifically the wording um, that she used around um, barriers versus opportunities. And really that is what EnviroBank sees when it looks um, at remote communities we see opportunities more than we see barriers. And uh, we worked really hard with East Arnhem Council on um, you know, addressing some of those um, uh, preconceived barriers and, and turning them into opportunities. And for us, the reason um, that we did that is as the scheme coordinator in the Northern Territory is our um, charter to make sure that everybody gets access to the container refund scheme. And in other states um, that had been operating for many, many years, it was always the remote communities that were um, either left out entirely or, or were an afterthought. And EnviroBank is an Indigenous owned company and it's part of our charter to care for country and obviously part of our responsibility as the scheme coordinator. So the first uh, remote community that we provided a service to before our partnership um, with East Arnhem Council was in fact Millingimby. And Emma spoke about Millingimby and the, you know, the number of containers um, that are available for collection in Millingimby. We took a reverse vending machine to Millingimby um, many years ago and wrapped, um, wrapped the CDS program around, um, around Millingimby. And that program um, was successful. Um, and until a person that was looking after it for us in community um, left community. So that's actually one of the learnings for us. And we're going to talk about um, at their program highlights, if we can um, get up the presentation. But that was really one of the learnings for us in running a CDS, a successful CDS program, um, which the East Arnhem Council um, do. And a successful CDS program is one that collects uh, multiple containers, but provides an economic benefit um, back to community. But those programs are only successful if all parties uh, are working towards the same aim. And this is why it's really important um, for council and community and service providers to really work together um, on objectives and outcomes that provide a win um, for everyone. Um, you know, if we talk about specifically the um, circular economy, um, in Emma's presentation, um, she did a great overview of what the circular economy is. And given that the circular economy is specifically an economic um, system that's aimed at reducing waste, well, this container deposit scheme does exactly that. So 
you know, a container deposit um, scheme in any state that it's operating operating in is most definitely um, a circular uh, circular economy tool, if you like. Um, another thing that Emma mentioned in her presentation um, that is interesting too, um, when she spoke about um, market and demand, and of course, you know, when when an organisation and and whether that's a, a private company or a commercial organisation or a council um, or any um, one in between, it always does come back to the numbers and, and um, the opportunity. But I think what's exciting today about what's happening in this market um, is some of the industry reforms that we have in place now um, due to you know, China um, banning the import of um, contaminated recyclables, um, you know, our growing population, the increasing use of um, PET containers, um, you know, for, the, for selling drinks, the number of, the, the amount of water that we consume out of a PET um, container these days and, and, you know, not from the garden hose like we did when I was a kid. Um, so we have an increasing population and an increasing amount of waste. And because we have that, we now have a market. So now it really is um, the challenge and the opportunity is really about, well, how do we take that waste and turn it into a resource? And how can we specifically do that in areas where it is challenging um, to access that resource? So Emma touched on a few things that, um, that they're considering in East Arnhem Council um, going forward. And again, um, given that there is so much of this product around and we don't really manufacture anything in this country anymore, the opportunity for, for council through its procurement um, policy is to really think about, okay, what do we have locally and what um, infrastructure could we perhaps um, support so we can reprocess some of that um, material um, locally. The program that we run um, with East Barnum Council and, and with other remote communities in our role as the scheme coordinator in the Northern Territory, we have a mobile uh, depot license. So the first step that we do is take the container refund service to the community. The second step is about engaging and working with the community to really do ourselves out of a job, if you like. So a success for EnviroBank when we're talking about remote communities is when we no longer provide the mobile service into the community, when the community take over and start to run those, um, those collections themselves which is what um, Emma and her team have done in East Arnhem Land. And the joyful part about that, um, and there really isn't another way to describe the program, the joyful um, part of that is the environmental benefits are obvious. The social um, benefits are the joyful part. And when you're providing service into many of these communities with low population and one or two jobs, jobs may only be available with um, council or with a local store. This container deposit scheme, um, if run effectively, actually provides every single person in the community the opportunity to access money. And to be an entrepreneur and start a new business, what do you need? You need capital. And if you go outside in community and pick up bottles and cans and present yourself to the collection um, on collection day, then the operator um, will give you money and you pop that money in your bank account and, um, and then away you go. So this is the part of the program that really excites us the most and the opportunity um, to do capacity and capability building, which is um, really important as well. And we take that um, we take that opportunity very seriously. And of course, if we think about, again, if we think about the circular economy and what are the positive um, outcomes um, from a circular economy, it isn't just about um, avoiding waste. It is about economic benefit too. It is about um, jobs. It is about um, capacity building. Um, it is about um, reducing our use of um, resources and the container deposit scheme in all of its glory um, does all of those things. Just, you know, just in terms of the magnitude of numbers, um, the container deposit market is an, uh, nationally is a $1 billion market. Um, 
the collections that Emma was um, speaking about, the first collections that um, we did um, in some of the communities, we, we started with you know, 15, 20, 30,000 um, containers per collection. Um, and that's in a remote community. So you can imagine what that looks like um, in, in our metropolitan um, cities, for example. The other thing that is important um, to note about the success of the container deposit um, scheme is really um, the attitude um, change, the attitude um, of the community when we bring a service like this into community. When we start to show community, um, when we start to reignite the conversation with community about caring for country. And caring for country is something that Aboriginal people do again as a daily charter. Um, so it's the opportunity for us to go back and have that re-engage with community and have that conversation about um, caring for country and then attaching an economic benefit um, to that. Um, there's, there's a win-win um, in all of that as well. Um, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion where I can answer any questions about the specifics of the program um, that we run with East Arnhem Council and other organisations that we work with. Um, but that's it. And I will circulate this presentation that I had with my beautiful um, graphics <laughs> um, after. Um, and I'll hand over to the next panellist. Thank you so much, uh, Narelle. Can we have a round of applause for Narelle Anderson? Thank you. And thank you for such a great presentation without the presentation. So I think you did an incredible job. So thank you very much. And we will distribute that around so everyone gets the PowerPoint that went along with that. Your next presenter as a part of the panel, uh, again, in the world of Zoom, uh, we have Jacob Wilson from Newgrow uh, joining us now. And Jacob, just checking, mate, can you hear us? Yeah, loud and clear. All good. Yeah. Can you hear me? Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, let's have a... Well, I was going to say tropical, warm Darwin welcome, but it's raining so deliciously here. So let's have a wet season round of applause uh, for Jacob, please. Yeah, thanks, Emma, for reaching out. Uh, short notice, so I'm glad that we could be a part of this morning. Uh, yeah, like everyone else, we're getting used to uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom, so bear with me if uh, something goes wrong, or please do call out if uh, I do drop out. Okay, Doug. So uh, I'm just here to speak this morning around what we do at New Grow, uh, and that is organic recycling. So I'm glad to hear uh, Emma discuss that East Arnhem was interested in that, and I did note that uh, Pete Soils is working with Fiolia and a few other parties in Darwin, uh, which is which is good to see. Uh, so our background is we provide uh, services all across Queensland uh, for organics. So everyone can see that map. Is that all right from you're in there? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect, thanks. So yeah, so the white the white little leaves there are our operational sites uh, in Bundaberg just underway for construction. Uh, so you can see we, we cover uh, a significant part of, of Queensland there and we obviously do um, accept waste from other, other hubs as well. So uh, the business has been around for 18 years uh, in that time to have grown from uh, a small site in Swanbank, which is uh, our Nipswich, where our head office is, is maintained, uh, and grown sites all up and down the coast uh, to match population centres. Um, all of those facilities are composting sites, some with different licensing from others, but um, in effect, we accept liquid waste and organic waste uh, from different municipalities and, and the normal players in the market. Uh, and also to uh, a large source of our, our fuel is obviously green waste from uh, FOGO contracts or, or garden garden waste contracts, uh, similarly uh, in all those, all those centres. So again, a circular economy from our point of view uh, is very much hinged around organics. Uh, and of course, there's a, our little, our little um, pictorial there that sort of explains our process. Uh, and again, you know, from the municipalities and the, and the commercial markets, the general waste um, is generated. Uh, so from those different markets, we accept grease traps and food waste and the like from uh, different centres. So if you're interested in that sort of um, that information, there's plenty of 
um, work on on that around our site. So please jump into newgrow.com.au. Uh, we talk about like maximizing recycling. So sure, we can just take certain parts and certain fractions of the waste and and do something with those. But we we do make a significant investment uh, in the actual product ourselves um, to to maximize the benefit out of that organics that comes into us. So if that means re reusing uh, or re breaking down that organic, so that we're definitely not contributing to any landfill. Um, obviously our goal is always zero, zero to landfill, but understandably, you know, we don't have the opportunity to um, access some, some particulars of our business that uh, just purely we need to go to landfill. So again, where we can, we, we maximize the recycling, but again, we, we can't be 100% uh, no, zero to landfill. So we take those products from, from the starting of the, the green waste and liquid waste and organics. Um, over a 12 to 16 week period, we uh, are composting those down. So what we go, we go through a thermophilic phase, meaning high temperature for a short period of time, then that mesophilic phase, which is a long-term sustained lower temperature profile. So in, in that temperature profile, we, we knock out all those nasties like E. coli and salmonella and other enteric viruses, uh, as well as stabilize the product too, so that when it's incorporated into the ground, um, we're adding a beneficial product back to, back to that environment. A key part of our business too is to revegetate land around us. So that's through the agricultural, agricultural uh, sector, uh, through civil infrastructure to major infrastructure, we're providing our products. And again, that, that, that fifth key point for us too is, is to return to the land, um, help clean up those waterways too where our, our products are applied and, and negate the issues around uh, fertilizer runoffs. And also too, we're conscious of our, our carbon cost as a business. So. What we mean by that is is finding every which way to be more efficient so that if there is a, a, a carbon cost going out, how do we negate that carbon cost coming back to us? So a little bit about us. So waste recycling, again, we take a diverse liquid and solid organic and FOGO streams uh, through our business. Our product supply is our other side of our business. So that means a high grade agricultural compost that go back out, um, that goes to different um, intensive cropping, uh, it goes to macadamias, to uh, other nut species, other tree species, uh, quite, a, quite a diverse network of agricultural partners, and then vertically integrating our business with reverge services. Uh, so those are the guys and girls in our team that uh, go back out and reuse our products into that civil infrastructure uh, situation. A noble project we worked on was uh, the second range crossing for Toowoomba, uh, a good stretch of road that was cut through mountainous terrain, which used to be uh, somewhat forest. So we went out, worked with those teams uh, to find background species of the plants in the area and the trees. Uh, we've revegetated those batters uh, effectively where the road now goes through and, and, and drops off uh, to, uh, to effectively make this road look like it was always existing now with this forest around it. Uh, that's just a, a wind road turn on one of our sites there. Uh, effectively just putting oxygen back into that system uh, over wind rate composting is aerobic, which means air is needed. So we've got to keep constantly um, providing energy and air into that process for it to work. So working with councils is, is a major part of our business. Uh, we know that around 40% of the bins, or the red, what we call red top bin here in Queensland, uh, is, is compostable material and the balance is at 60% is, is what would be at the moment without any intervention, we go to landfill. So. It's interesting someone said there was a low hanging fruit there before it's uh, a terminology it's, it's always used. And again, it makes sense uh, from our end where organics makes up a significant portion of that red top bin. Um, and in some municipalities, they don't have any other access uh, to recycling services. So to introduce something like a FOGO or a green waste only bin uh, moving towards a compulsory FOGO service, and it makes a lot of sense for councils who have uh, high recycling targets and really want to get a lot of that weight out of the bin. And if their metric is tonnages, it makes sense to, to invest in organics to get that tonnage number up. We operate the uh, only Queensland-based FOGO contract at the moment. Uh, we've held that uh, since 2011. I know other councils we work with have now made um, comment they're going to FOGO, such as Gold Coast City Council by 2023. So again, we welcome uh, we welcome that from their end and hopefully other councils up and down the coast uh, follow the, the tact of down south and introduce FOGO as well. So just by, by way of a metric, 21% of Ipswich 
um, has a green bin at home, which they can put food waste and, and garden organics in. Uh, since then, we've removed another 22,000 tonne outside of what have gone, would, would have gone to landfill. Uh, and just to put a, a bit of a, a number around, about 66 football fields um, has been revegetated by us uh, undertaking this program. So again, different to landfill, we take something in, part of that circular economy is we have to send something back out. So I won't go too much into the product supply because uh, I understand everyone's time conscious, but again, everything that's taken into our site needs to be recycled and turned into high grade compost. Again, meets Australian standard, meets other main road standards as well. Um, and again, our clients at the other end too, being farmers may want certain different uh, recipes and the like that may be enhancing their yield, uh, et cetera. Uh, just the use of us in, in intensive cropping situations, the image on the left was uh, uh, a control site, so no compost was applied. We applied a 30 tonne per hectare um, ameliorant rate uh, to the same crop there. And everything was exactly the same as the fertilizer application and the water. And what, what it proved to us was that we had about a 30% yield in crude proteins. Um, the density as well per square meter was higher, uh, which in turn for us at the time, which we were going through drought uh, when that program was on meant that that farmer we did the trial with was able to feed his own beast, but also to uh, sell that uh, that fodder on. So again, it was a it was a win win for that uh, that party. Uh, sustainability and quality uh, very important to us. Again, we need know we know from a circular economy point of view that um, the municipalities that we work with, um, we would like them to be um, a net importer of product as well. So if you create the waste in your community, you have to take the waste back as, as re renewed products. So we very much are putting efforts um, around that to make sure that um, pre-tendering meetings, we, we, we meet with council and talk about what their part of the chain is, is as well. Uh, as someone alluded to before is, um, we need to be conscious that from the waste industry, the recycling industry, uh, it's not our battle only. Uh, we need to talk about at the, at the front of the program to the stewardship all the way through the actual life cycle of these products. Again, just a, just a, um, a high level uh, look of our systems uh, around our sustainability and our innovation as well. Uh, I, won't do, I won't do it on this slide too much. Um, but again, I'll, I'll have this circulated around as well uh, from Emma and the team, uh, if anyone's interested. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on my details as well to themselves if uh, anyone wants to have a, have a chat after the fact of today's um, symposium. But again, uh, I thank uh, everyone who's made time to come out this morning, uh, sorry, this afternoon, um, who has a, has a vested interest in waste. Because again, it's not going away, it's only getting bigger. I think it's about time that um, not only Queensland, but NT invests in organics uh, to be more sustainable into the future. So thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate that. Uh, and our last presentation before we jump into the panel section, and you've you've been so patient sitting there on the side of everything, ready to go. You must be the rain must be exciting for the garden, yeah. It's a, it must be, yeah. This is all hitting that place as well, just around the corner. Uh, let's have a huge round of applause and welcome to the stage from the Jingley Community Garden, Ian, Esther, and Gwen. Hello, yeah. So we're all on the committee of Jingley Community Garden. Um, and I was going to talk to the sort of technical... Uh, first, thanks to Emma Clay, who invited us along to your discussion of the circular economy today, uh, and to provide some uh, context on uh, community gardening, as, you know, its place in a circular economy. And um, I, I'll start off just with the sort of technical challenges uh, of a community garden and in a circular economy. And uh, I'll pass on to Esther. Uh, we've been running for a, a fair while. So we're sort of a sustainable organization, I suppose. So if you're, you're looking at a community gardening model uh, that's reasonably likely to succeed in the long term, then Esther and Gwen here can really answer questions on that. Uh, Esther could talk to our membership uh, management, which is really the core business is where self-funding 
So we don't go around, we don't rely on government grants outside funding. So that's Esther's specialty. And Gwen uh, was a foundation member of the garden and she can talk to the history of it and the motivation, very strong original motivation that sort of kept it going and uh, sort of pottering along. We're not, we're sort of a minimal sort of input type organization, but I think that's probably the one that's most likely to succeed. So initially my background, I'm an ag scientist, a soil scientist. I uh, did my PhD at Sydney Uni on designing landscapes and soil covers to restore biodiversity to degraded land systems. And uh, so I I've got a fairly sort of reasonable understanding underlying environmental processes that are working in different sort of land uses. I gave a keynote last week, uh, sort of unusually uh, at a um, conference in Indonesia, sort of a Zoom conference on um, designing sustainability. So I talked to uh, designing, the importance of designing land capability into uh, project design at a conceptual stage to sort of conserve um, or to basically sustain our economic uh, system. So I see uh, gardening or soil, it's really the primary technical centre for the circular economy on earth. You know, we've got a life, basically it's the technical centre for recycling life. So you've got a whole uh, uh, assemblage of animals, plants, uh, fungi, all sorts of things, everything that you could possibly think of in terms of a life form basically disaggregating what you throw out that's biodegradable, breaking it down. It's almost, could be an, an analogy for a successful uh, circular economy for um, uh, artificial substrates. But, you know, it's a very complex system without going into all the detail. And eventually at the end of it all, you get uh, microbes that turn that original organic waste into minerals, nitrates, phosphates, uh, potassium salts and things like that, that the plants then recycle and they grow and then you eat the plant. So there's a very complex circular economy going around in the soil. And uh, so yeah, I've got this technical background this into that process understanding. And then I was sort of inspired long ago by a book by um, George Cadbury of Cadbury Chocolate fame. And uh, they built the first green city, their Bourneville model city in Birmingham, I think in 1901. And they realized that um, you know, to have a happy, healthy workforce and a a reasonably viable urban environment that wasn't just degrading people's lives. You had to design agriculture into the city footprint. So I think community gardens, from my point of view, have a very important place in urban design. In the Cadbury Green City, uh, they had it basically took people out of the slums of Glasgow, I suppose, and Birmingham, gave them a backyard garden where they could grow a tree, and they gave them a, an allotment system. So everyone had a, an allotment on the town common where they could grow food. And that's pretty well how Jingli Community Garden operates. It's like an old fashioned allotment system. So that's the sort of background in town planning and soil science. And I think also, I, my first job was in Papua New Guinea. I was a food crops agronomist. And uh, we've, I know it's quite a resource. I know in Australia, agriculture wasn't probably necessary because the population density wasn't high enough to demand it. But, in New Guinea, 10,000 years ago, people de developed agriculture at the same time as they did in uh, Mesopotamia, which is quite incredible when you think about it. I'm not sure what drove it. I think in Mesopotamia, it was people had to concentrate around a river in a desert and uh, they had to sort of, I don't know exactly what was going on. But uh, yeah, I guess it was an intense land use agricultural development. Same happened in the highlands of New Guinea 10,000 years ago. And that informs the way I garden at least. So we're an organic garden. Uh, we basically recycle organic waste as much as we can. That generally comes down to composting for most people. But in that PNG sort of Melanesian system, it's, it's green waste, green manuring really. You mound the soil up uh, over the green tops of the sweet potato or whatever you're growing and you recycle things directly on your garden. You don't have a lot of transporting material off the garden. It's, it's fairly... Um, sort of low energy type gardening system. So, I mean, you get similar sorts of setups in permacultural systems and things like that. But essentially the challenge for gardening here in a community garden that's running organically is supplying nutrients to get a reasonable crop. And the main nutrients you need are nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. They're the major nutrients the plants take up. They need to grow and to reproduce, to grow a crop. 
And if you don't add some sort of fertilizer, then uh, you run out of nitrogen. You don't get much crop. In New Guinea, they have a, a rotational system, a forest fallow. So you need about a 30 year forest fallow to get the nutrient levels up after a couple of sweet potato crops. Once you start, once the population density gets too high for a 30 year fallow and you have you get down to about a 10 year fallow, you end up with a, a very degraded environment, a kunai grass fallow, just a, a rough sort of um, blady grass fallow. But essentially, you really need to manage nutrients, no matter what you're doing, whether it's um, chemical agriculture, you have to buy the nutrients in. But for us, we're recycling them and you can't really get enough out of just uh, you know, uh, reburying your green tops. So you need to get uh, nutrients in from somewhere else. And this is really what prevents us stepping up to take a more active role in the circular economy. Uh, but um, we use the uh, manure waste from a, an adjustment stable down the road, just one of our neighbors. It's a critical input to our system. And also in terms of nitrogen, uh, which is really the main bulk nutrient that's going in, there is a huge waste stream out of Darwin. I think there's 80 gigalitres a year of uh, primary sewage sludge, those treated sewage that goes into ocean outfalls. 10% um, of that is urine. I think 10 to 15% of that is urine. And that makes up 75 to 80% of the nutrient load that we put on the ocean environment. So, you know, there's a huge capacity, I would think, to um, Recycle, well, that's basically urea that you can either buy in a bag at Bunnings or recycle yourself. You could, everyone can think of themselves as a little fertilizer factory and um, recycle urine. That's what I do. And I grow a very good corn crop and sweet potato. So I think uh, these, are, these are sort of issues that are sort of fundamental to urban agriculture. Uh, we do it in a very small scale way, but you know, it could become more important. Uh, I think. Um, Emma pointed out the long supply chains here and you know uh, uh, the soils here are depauperate. There's no nutrients in them, uh, very low sort of nutrient holding capacity. They're deeply weathered. So you're, you're essentially looking at conserving organic matter to give it some nutrient holding capacity and also providing some reasonable inputs of nitrogen, potassium and phosphate uh, principally and other things as well. But uh, yeah, the challenge here I think is um, to, I think, make uh, community gardens a part of any urban plan, just for the health of the community, and perhaps the long-term, uh, you know, cheap sustainability of uh, agricultural systems in a place like Darwin is quite remote. And um, yeah, I think that's probably all I want to say. I think technically it's, it's a, a pretty, it fits into the circular economy model pretty well, uh, particularly to do with recycling sewage waste and um, uh, organic waste, uh, municipal waste. And then the other challenges are membership. So uh, I'll ask Esther now to talk to our membership model. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. Yes, um, well, communi Chingali Community Garden is run by a membership. Uh, unlike some of the others, uh, a garden, community garden in Darwin. So because we're one of the oldest one established in the, in the 90s. Uh, so we've established plots, individual plots within a, a, a bigger framework of the, 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 the land we are on, which is actually been given to us by the Darwin City Council originally, and it is fenced off. So uh, within that, uh, we have, like I said, uh, 30 plots. So the um, and you can join by um, owning one of those individual plots. So it is a membership fee, an annual fee, and um, then there is a communal area with um, mainly fruit trees, and we sort of then encourage people to uh, have. We have working bees, monthly working bees, so the so. That's where we sort of tend to get our community input from everyone and do the networking about how we grow, what, what grows, et cetera. Because most people here in Darwin, they're new, a lot of them are new to this communal gardening. They want to have a garden, they can't have a garden at home, like myself, because I've got too much shade or 
not enough shade, not enough, uh, too much roots that interfere with this. So, and we have over the years established a good soil there in our community garden. So it's, it's good, but people often start off, yes, it's great to grow your veggies, but don't know how to go about it. And so it's good to network and these community or working bees are really a good way of doing that. Um, however, we are run by a, co a committee um, within basically members. And um, so the costs involved are really just our insurance, the liability insurance, that's the main component. And whilst we have, uh, like I said, the, the land's given to us and we have water was supply, is supplied by the power and water and, and um, the gardens. So, it, like I said, it comes with challenges. Challenges are often, of course, the irrigation, but also people um, not, you know, bringing in all these other waste products, which is scrap material and uh, uh, fencing, individual plots wants to be wanted. You know, everyone can run their own plot the way they wish, of course, but when you're looking at the bigger scheme, um, there is a lot of waste that goes in the garden by, with pavers, with plastic, especially plastic is a big thing that eventually goes into the soil. Uh, we have, uh, for example, one of my issue I find is plastic pots. These plastic pots that people bring in plants in is, this is, Landfill. This is something that we is a one way uh, plastic use for, I think, you know, this gets, where do we end up with that? You know, there's actually quite a lot gets accumulated over time. And of course, this is something that people need to think about and we have to deal with in the end, because in the end, it just ends up in landfill as well. You know? um, so these are the challenges that we face, uh, but uh, in terms of um, output is, or rather what people gain from it is enormous. You know, the, the um, like I said, the gardens, the vegetables, etc. And yeah, it's great. Sorry. <laughs> um, look, uh, I think Gwen can give you a little bit more about the history of it as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's not quite true what Ian said about me being in the garden from the start. I've only been in the garden 20 years and it was established 25 years ago by Lila Notley, who was a very forward thinking person. And she approached um, George Brown, who was then head of Darwin City Council. <coughs> about the idea of wanting to establish a community garden and to see if Darwin City Council would like to be a sponsor. So they actually took on the sponsorship and gave land at, as part of the Jingley Water Gardens off Freshwater Road, right near the bike path. And there's, they've since planted a fruit orchard up the top of us but we're an enclosed area further down, about halfway down, between Freshwater Road and Rapid Creek. Um, it's a very safe place. It gives people a safe place to come and garden. And there's, they're a very diverse group of people, of course, all like-minded about what they want to do. Um, but we are all learning from each other. And it's, it's about swapping ideas, swapping seeds, swapping produce, but growing things yourself that you know haven't been grown with the aid of chemicals. And one of the ideas that, uh, that um, Lila had why she wanted to set up a community garden was that she actually had a successful operation for cancer and she wanted to be able to grow 
uh, to buy organic vegetables somewhere. <clears throat> and in the um, mid 90s, there weren't any places that actually had organic vegetables. So she established a group uh, of like-minded people who were interested in a community garden and they had vegetables brought up from Western Australia originally and it was a cart that they sold vegetables from at Parap Markets. Some of you might remember it. But anyway, once the garden was established, it was established in 1995, started off very small, um, but it gradually grew to 30 plots and we're non-profit, everything goes back into the garden. But it's just a great way for people to learn about gardening too. We have quite a few people who say they don't know how to garden. And I was like that myself initially when I came into it. And I met Lila one day at the vegetable cart and she just said, well, come and join and we'll teach you. And we're all still learning and it's just really great. And it's very social. And it's something that a lot of people uh, who are walking past on the bike path, walking their dogs, they'll always stop and have a chat and ask what you're doing. And then quite a few of those people have uh, become members as well. So it's an ongoing thing. And I always think sustainability means um, lasting and hopefully we've set up something that will be lasting and help people with the next generation to keep gardening as well. I can't think of anything else to say. I think that's it. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Emma, should we start some questions and then have a pause for afternoon tea and crack into it? Do you reckon while well, everyone's fresh from those presentations with the, yeah? I reckon we should. Uh, actually, let, let's consensus this. Does everyone need a break or does everyone want to jump straight in and get into questions while you're thinking about the things that we've been talking about with circular economy? Uh, we'll be going home on time. That's the one thing I judge the successful MC on. Don't worry, that happens. Any Anyone have any strong feelings either or? Yeah, there we go. That is the assertive thing I wanted. Um, shall we bring the chairs into the middle so it feels a bit more like a forum set up and we'll get our two friends up on the screen? Yes, that is our, yep, that's our audience mic and this is our panel mic. Here we go. I'll pass this over to you, Emma. We've got Narelle and Jacob on the screen there as well. We've also got the roving camera, so watch out. You may appear on the roving camera. Excellent. Uh, great. I'm going to hand over to Emma. You're going to convene this one. Or would you like me to go straight to questions? All right, easy. We're going to go straight to questions. Does anyone have something for the panel or for a specific human being at this stage? And Emma's not out there to save you by asking questions. So you're the ones who have to, yes. Here we go. Oh, Thank you. Um, this is to Jingli. Um, I was just wondering what sort of membership turnover you have with only 30 plots. I'm just wondering how that goes. Yeah, well, this is interesting because uh, in the last couple of years, it, the, the, it has actually, the demand has grown a lot. Um, for people to wanting to start. So, well, we get usually around, I would say, 10 to 15% that maybe only last a year, okay? Because memberships go yearly. So, and you can renew and so on. Um, but there is, the rest is pretty much a core where you, they, most of them stay between three and longer, three years and longer. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, anything? And just another thing maybe, we have um, usually from families to um, multiple uh, uh, sort of smaller groups, like for example, the Milner Primary School has just uh, sort of parents and part of the 
uh, teachers have joined uh, as a, a group to take over a plot. They, we actually showed them the garden this year. Um, they came about three or four times to with their small preschoolers to go uh, spend a couple of hours showing them uh, the garden and, and they get involved with all sorts of, we, we sort of take turns of showing them the garden. And um, yes, they established their own garden in the, at the school and uh, sort of like we sort of network and we're hoping to network with them much more closely in the future. Yeah, I, I just make a point that um, being um, on top of membership is really core business for us because we are self-funding and um, Esther and Gwen do an excellent job making sure that vacant plots are filled. And just, I mean, it's not complicated, but you've got to be on to it. You have people who are um, going to follow people up and introduce them to the garden. So yeah, we, we have quite a lot of turnover and we manage it pretty well. Thank you. Uh, another question over here. So thanks for all those presentations uh, today. It was a good example of the different scales. Um, and what I suppose my question to the panel in general, you've got from the low end, you've got the community garden doing your composting and uh, organics there through to New Grove. No, New, um, oh, there it is, New Grove up the top there, um, doing large scale composting. And I suppose from the panel in general, I'd just like to hear comments about um, what implications us as local government practice, practitioners can take from some of your examples and potentially put in place. I was going to start start from the very top. New Grove. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Yeah, look, I think uh, in certain circumstances, uh, composting at home makes sense. Uh, obviously, the tyranny of distance. So someone in Tennant Creek is unlikely going to be able to access the service from Darwin. It makes sense. Um, from our point of view, Councils need to be responsible for the waste that comes out of their municipalities, as well as product that comes in. And the only way that um, organic recycling uh, will get off the ground is if councils are committed um, to a long-term focus. Um, issues in the past in Queensland uh, and Northern New South Wales for us have been short-term contracts. So one plus one plus one, um, it doesn't drive uh, any changes uh, economically nor does it change anything from innovative uh, solutions either when you can't uh, amortize capital over a longer term in a period and also also too I, I may mention that with a longer term contract obviously they need to be heavily kpi to ensure that the monopolization of that uh, part of the council's industry um, still provides innovation and the like over the term of the contract as well so i think that that needs to be to be looked at but again, I think councils and private industry need to work closer together um, and more collaboratively to have beneficial outcomes. Because I think a lot of the time um, contracts are let, um, the same solution uh, comes up and then nothing else happens with it. So I don't think there's any value add apart from we make mulch and it goes straight back into gardens. I think there's a lot more that can be done around FOGO uh, in the Northern Territory and across Australia, that is. Um, but again, that needs buy-in from council. And I'll be quite frank, FOGO will cost money. But I think too, I'd be more concerned about the extra jobs uh, and providing services to the extra households and people who move to those areas uh, with the um, disposable income that comes from those extra jobs. We all know that for every job in landfill of 10,000 ton, about nine uh, jobs are equivalent to 10,000 ton outside the landfill. It makes sense to me not only from uh, an economic sense, but also from a job sense and a monetary sense as well. But again, we need stewards inside the councils to make those decisions. Um, and they're hard decisions to make, you know, with, with increased costs. But again, I think you need to take an economic perspective on it, not just a, a monetary uh, narrow focus. Does that make sense? And the reality is we had an announcement of a new strategy this morning that's got a very ambitious 
organics recycling target in it. So um, it's got to happen one way or another. Yeah, I'd love to get a copy of that. I'll, I'll have a read of it. Further questions? Sorry, I've got one here. Sorry, I'm not taking over. Don't call the union. Um, Ken from McDonald Regional Council. That, I, I really enjoyed all those presentations this afternoon. Um, well done on those, uh, very informative. Um, I guess the question I've got is for Emmy and Emma and Ori. Um, that, that kind of joint venture you're going into now, when you crunched all those numbers that you showed up on the screen, is it commercially viable for you or is it a heavily subsidized um, project you're undertaking um, with the council, you know, backing it? I guess the biggest, uh, not problem, but uh, logistics is obviously the biggest cost, especially in T and um, getting out to these communities. So there was a big uh, cost involved to uh, mobilize our equipment. Uh, you can imagine a 21 ton excavator, a baler, um, a trailer, side loader, uh, 20 foot containers. Uh, these are big machines that uh, obviously take up a lot of space onto these barges and to uh, get them out to these communities, uh, there's obviously a cost. Uh, but as I remember said, there's a, um, uh, well, CCF have come to the party and uh, looking at moving the materials back. Uh, unfortunately, with, with the way that the scrap value is at the moment, there's not a, a, a great deal of margin uh, for a rebate back to the community. Um, but at the same time, I think the community uh, have decided that uh, one way or another, the waste has to be moved off site. Uh, there's going to be obviously a cost uh, on this particular occasion because there's so much there to remove. But going forward, uh, MRI will sit down after this project is completed and see what we can do to then make it a bit more cost effective for her and the community to remove the waste from site. Uh, but yeah, we've got to get the initial uh, scrap off site first and then we can work out uh, ways to make it a bit more uh, economical for them. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are other types of uh, materials, uh, you know, coppers, stainless steel, aluminum, those types of things that uh, even lead acid batteries uh, that have uh, a value on them. And if C-Swift uh, keep that uh, initial uh, uh, thing going back to down at nil cost, then there's definitely uh, money to be made in that respect. Yeah, so council is incurring a cost for this scrap metal contract, a significant cost. Um, however, we are removing all metal from our legacy waste sites and looking at those sites, the waste that is left there is predominantly metal. So all metal that is protruding from the ground will be removed to below ground level and recovered um, by Ori and his team. Um, it, it was a request from our community for, for this to happen. And as Ori said, we're gonna really look at options long-term. So clear the backlog. We're thinking potentially having a trained person using an oxy to come out either on a six monthly or 12 monthly basis to cut anything that's too large for us to transport in smaller containers down. And then we can just have a continual flow of metal coming out of community from this point forward. So we never get into this situation again. Other questions? Uh -huh. yeah. um, just for the... Um, uh, in terms of this, uh, the separation of the metals and all that stuff that you're doing, is that happening in Darwin from here when you're bringing it back or from wherever? Yeah. And the separation is done in Darwin. And what happens to all the toxic stuff that can't be recycled? Is that going? Where is that going? So depending on the type of materials, there's only certain things that we accept. Uh, if it has any toxic materials inside them, for instance, uh, vehicles have obviously uh, fuels, uh, batteries that have lead acid uh, in them as well. They all have to be removed before we can actually process them. Uh, we don't separate the materials. They have to, well, when I say we don't, there are certain materials that we can separate and other materials that we can't. For instance, white goods. There's uh, copper wiring in them. There's different types of uh, metals inside them. So we'll bale them, bale them 
and then we'll send them down to our shredding plant in uh, New South Wales, which will then separate, we'll go through a shredder. The shredder will then break down all the materials, separate the steel from the different types of non-ferrous materials. And there's uh, obviously waste in that as well. And as I mentioned before, we've got a, a plant that actually uh, sorts through the soils and uh, separates all the waste from that as well. And also uh, accumulates or recovers some of the precious metals from that as well. So there's a, there's a process in place, but there's also types of materials that we don't accept that we can't handle. Well, then that's up to the community to uh, dispose of. We only handle the uh, metal. Yeah. So that question from David. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, in terms of things that council could do to. I mean, we don't really step up into the circular economy, you know, in terms of recycling things um, like uh, new soil, new grow, um, and the main barrier is probably. Um, and we've been approached to recycle shredded paper and coffee grounds. And I just do the maths on it. And basically we'd have to ameliorate, get the carbon nitrogen ratio down because uh, to get things to degrade properly. So you're talking about bringing in cow manure. It's, a, it's quite a, an operation for us. We're a bit too small. I'm not sure whether council could facilitate um, some community type recycling process but uh, it would be uh, a mean uh, you know really you've got to follow the nutrient streams and I think the main one is stuff going in the ocean outfall uh, and apart from that we can salvage manure from feedlots and things like that but uh, we would have to have some sort of business model which we don't have at the moment to really participate in this uh, recycling uh, well, you know, commercial economy. Um, I have a question well a kind of a question for Narelle. Narelle, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Um, so on my presentations, one of the next steps that we've had a couple of discussions about was potentially doing some plastic processing and 3D printing in our own communities. Um, obviously, with the introduction of the container deposit schemes, we have um, ample amount of plastic um, being generated within our communities. I was just wondering if you could talk about what would be involved in that and um, the implications with the ownership of the plastic and that type of thing. Mm. Um, good question. So first of all, in, in respect um, to the Northern Territory, given we are one of the scheme um, coordinators, the ownership of that material lies with the scheme coordinators. So for us to be able to process the plastic in um, community um, into another product, um, and really tick off the circular economy uh, outcome from that, we would need to seek permission from the other scheme coordinators because the material that we're collecting belongs to all three combined. Um, we're, we're the collector of it um, out of the council. Um, given that the other two scheme coordinators are both um, beverage, in, beverage companies, um, I don't think that that would be too difficult a task for, for us um, and certainly a conversation that we'd be delighted to facilitate with them. Um, because, so once that uh, is done, then it really is a matter of, okay, what is the tech that we need um, to bring into community on a um, small scale um, trial level so that we can um, pelletize the PET um, and then uh, make it into uh, some kind of filament. And what other materials that maybe sit outside the container deposit scheme, could we also look at um, pelletizing and um, exporting? So what is not covered in the container deposit scheme at the moment um, is shampoo bottles or made from HDPE, um, which is a very valuable um, product, you know, um, in a reprocessing, from a reprocessing perspective, perspective. So that's something that we could have a look at too. So the first um, step would be getting permission. I think we can do that easily. The second um, step would be having a look at not just the CDS material, but what other material um, could we pelletize in community? That, that's really the next step. And correct me if I'm wrong, because that, um, that material has been processed, it would be able to be sold to markets either on or offshore? 
Yes, um, it's no longer a waste. Uh, it's no longer considered a waste stream. It is most definitely a very valuable um, resource once it is um, processed in that way. So pelletizing that product would mean that it could be uh, exported. Also, um, pelletizing that material um, to, to export it out of community makes sense as well, right? Um, you know, at the moment, uh, East Arnhem Council has a, a wonderful arrangement with um, C-SWIFT, but, um, you know, what, what happens if that's not possible in the future? What other ways can we look at, um, to, you know, to save on e exporting resources and the cost of moving material out of community? Uh, just one other question, which could be for a possible in a rail, but it's a sort of a challenge again, too. When you're talking about these pet uh, um, bottles, um, can the lids also be processed? Are they getting processed together with it? Because there has been some issues, oh, we shouldn't really put lids in the bins. Some lids are plastic, some are metal, some are combined -ish, and if we do, I mean, Japan, for example, does an incredible separation there of all their different components already from at home, basically, they're uh, obliged to do that. So, yes, my question is basically with that process, if you if that's going to go ahead, is what's the issue with the with that other component, the lids? Yeah, so, so the issue um, is that the, lid, the, the lids of a PET bottle are made from a different um, product. So, and then Nirvana and Utopia um, for any kind of recycling program is that it is free from contamination. So if you're recycling PET, for example, then any other product that is not PET, PET regardless of whether it is a recyclable product, is considered a, a contaminant in that stream. So the, the lids, um, there's, some real, there's been some really great trial programs um, done around reprocessing lids. There's a program that was run out of um, Victoria where they were making uh, prosthetic limbs um, for, for um, kids from the uh, lids from PET bottles. So there's certainly an opportunity uh, for that. So you could collect those materials and pelletize them um, both. Um, obviously you'll pelletize them um, separately. So you have two different streams, but there's most definitely an opportunity for that product as well. And this comes back to really educating the market on what is best practice for recycling. If it comes to the facility and, and the separation has to be done there, now we're adding an additional cost um, to the processing. If we educate our consumer market and say, well, look, if you're going to put those containers into the bin or drop them off at your um, CDS depot, just separate the lid from the bottle, put the lids here and the bottle there, and now we've got a nice clean, um, now we've got a nice clean waste stream and recycling stream rather, and actually two recycling streams that we can do something with. Um, so it, that that comes back to uh, education. Narelle, I might just jump in there. We have a same similar issue with the FOGO with Ipswich. Is uh, a fear for us is once something goes to compulsory, you know, the stewards of the program are uh, overwhelmed by other people that participate. So again, you know, I think a big part of any any scheme is to make sure the education piece is is well delivered and well rounded to make it uh, understandable um, why we need clean clean waste streams or resource streams. I think that'd go a long way to helping people understand uh, what it means to that program as well. And obviously a cleaner stream means a lower price uh, for the constituents. Yeah. There is another challenge um, in terms of transporting PET containers with um, lids on them if we're bailing the um, product because um, plastic has a memory, so it can impact um, and cause the bales to explode. Um, so there's a safety um, issue too, which is why we always ask people to take the lids off when we're transporting materials. But both are very viable um, recycling materials. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> um, my question is to the room. We've got lots of councils in here. Um, I was just wondering if there's any councils that are mulching or composting their green waste and what that operation looks like. Oh, 
Yes, um, so Oliver from Alice Springs. Uh, we've been doing it for quite some time out there. Um, any, any of our green waste goes through a tub grinder that gets grounded down and then just watered for about six weeks, turning over processing over time. Uh, and then we just sell it out to the general public for, for quite a cheap price, just to, again, to sort of remove it from the landfill itself. So that's just all down a separation before it even gets to the landfill, make sure when they go to the transfer station, green bins are there, palm bins are there, because the palms don't work so well on the tub grinder. So yeah, it's just, again, it's just giving the information out to the general public when they when they turn up on the place. So we're also doing um, a Fergo trial at the moment as well. So we'll see how that goes, but not gonna say any more until we, we've seen how it goes, but so far, so good. That's awesome. There's um, definitely, sorry, I'm Charlotte. I'm the environment officer at the town council. There's definitely a lot of challenges with the Fogo education wise and contamination. We just have a small people or small pool of participants at the moment, but certainly because we don't have someone we can contract the composting side things out to, it's um, a big undertaking for the staff at the regional waste management facility managing the contamination. So we'll see how it goes if we go out to the larger community. Yeah, we'd love to reach out to yourselves uh, to even have a, have a conversation around if there's something we can help uh, with out there as well. Um, we've looked at regional sites uh, and on different mining camps as well for smaller footprints. You know, a normal footprint now is around uh, 10 hectares upwards to around 50 hectares. So but I'd, I'd be good to uh, grab your details after if I could from Emma or Meredith. I uh, would like to reach out to you guys. Oh, not so much a question, more a response to Emma's question. So um, Nick Walker from Veolia, I look after the NT business up here. Um, I don't want to, I guess, uh, speak on behalf of the councils that we're currently representing. They, um, during the course of this symposium, will obviously speak for themselves. Um, I guess what we're seeing is a great opportunity um, to the point very early days with the city of Darwin, we have pulled out about 1500 tonne of commercial green waste that was otherwise ending up in landfill. Now, the development of that and the next step is, um, <coughs> excuse me, is obviously to look at the inputs. Um, in terms of the inputs and getting it to an organic product, there is a lot of opportunity in Darwin. Uh, not only in terms of FOGO, you know, we can be looking at things like grease trap as well. We can be looking at sludges and muds. Um, you know, we're talking about onshore gas. It could even in the fullness of time, you could be looking at drilling muds, um, options such as that. So the intent is certainly there and certainly on a volume basis, what we're already noticing very early days is that the green waste that we're extracting from the landfilling process is not actually keeping up with the demand that the market currently is looking for. Um, and, and that's very much across City of Darwin, City of Palmerston. Uh, I hazard a guess that that would extend right throughout the territory. And also a round of applause for our team who are joining us via Zoom. So a massive big thank you to Narelle and Jacob. You're welcome to move out of the way or you can stay there, whichever makes you feel the most comfortable. That is absolutely fine. Thank you, my friends. Well, you've we've done an amazing thing where we finished really early uh yeah I mean like that's a sign of a good conference isn't it you know like one that's just like let's let's move and move and move uh I guess we have the space until four o'clock so that means you have a really great opportunity here if you wanted to network catch up with people have some really good conversations about some of these things although it was mentioned to me that a lot of you have come from um out of town and that getting to the shops at some point might be a part of your planning so i will not 
prevent anyone from achieving those goals. But whatever your goals are, please make sure that you use this time wisely. Afternoon tea is at the back, so you can just have a snack, have a chat. Uh, but otherwise, in terms of formal proceedings in the symposium, we're back here tomorrow, 8.30 registration, 9 o'clock first presentation. Can I please get you to put your hands together and thank all of the presenters that we've had so far today? Michael on tech, Meredith and the team who have done an amazing job putting this together. Uh, another day and a half to go in the wonderful, sexy world of waste management, friends. Uh, I'm going to eat some of that afternoon tea with you and otherwise I'll see you tomorrow. Well done, everyone. Thanks. Yeah.